good to see all you guys tonight. Uh, is anybody out there like me this evening? You've had a really long, hard week this week. Let me see some hands. Yep, I'm not the only one. That's really nice. Uh, and I've also been running around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to catch my tail. Anybody else be able to relate to me in that way? Kind of trying to catch your breath. <laughs> it's been kind of a rough week trying to, trying to catch my breath. But as we begin this time of worship, I want to invite you to call upon the Lord with us, uh, the one who never abandons us and leaves us defenseless, even in the, the times whenever we're left and we're wondering where he's at. He's always right beside us, even if we can't see him right there in that moment. So before we begin, before we get too much further, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 43, and we're going to read a passage together. I just think the reading of Scripture together corporately uh, with one voice is really something special and something that Christians can hold dearly. So in Psalm 43, as you're flipping there, I'll kind of give you some context as to what we're about to read about. Um, the psalm writer here is he's kind of schizophrenic in some ways. He's talking to himself, talking to his own personal soul, trying to convince himself that God hasn't left him, trying to sort out the feelings he has for God at the moment where he's really upset with the way that God's been treating him, um, putting him through some hard times. And uh, so whenever we finally get to verse 5, he comes to this uh, revelation and he convinces himself. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So if tonight, if you're looking for some uh, reason in particular to worship, worship in light of the fact that God has never left you. He's never stra stranded you on an island all by yourself. He's walking with you through every stretch of life. So if you have to convince yourself, tell yourself, why, oh my soul, why are you cast down? Why are you distraught? And open up your heart to the Holy Spirit and make yourself vulnerable to the work that he's going to do in you tonight. And believe with faith that God can do an amazing work in your life. So uh, continue standing with us as we sing a new one. This is called Arise.
gathered for my good. You made all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Mercy never fails. Your love goes on forever and ever. And one of the ways that we, as people, as humans, as your creation, one of the ways that we show our love to you, um, one of the ways we show our love to you is just not being ashamed of your gospel, God. Being brave in your word and your love and your light. Showing other people, <clears throat> telling others about you and not being ashamed of your gospel. Um, God, our prayer is tonight that you will make us brave and courageous beyond what we can understand and get our fears out of the way. Fear means nothing to us because in you we can do all things.
Father, we thank you for your presence in our lives and the fact that we never walk alone. Your love never fails, not ever, not even once. You're always with us through the trials and through the storms and through the good times too. We can't thank you enough for, for the blessings that you pour out on us and the fact that we get to take part in, in building your kingdom and bringing you glory. I ask that you be with John as he presents your message to us tonight. I ask that you give us open hearts and open minds to the things that you want to say. And all this I ask in your precious son's holy name. Amen. All right. Well, we're continuing our series this semester through the book of Acts. And the title of the series is, series is Mission, the Church in Motion. And I think this is such an exciting study, man, because God took an ordinary, broken group of people. Does that sound familiar? That's what you look at in the mirror every time is an ordinary, broken person. That's what I'll see in the mirror reflected as an ordinary, broken person. And he took a, a group of ordinary, this ragtag bunch of nobodies, and he changed the world. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's pretty unprecedented for, God, for a, a group of nobodies from this global dot on the map to impact the planet. And so here's the deal. Here's the encouragement. As we read the book of Acts, as we kind of go chunk by chunk, bite by bite, you know, we're going to break this book up into bite-sized portions. We'll take another bite of the book tonight. But here's the deal. If God could take that group of ordinary broken people and change the world, then it's possible for him to take another group of ordinary broken people and change a campus, or maybe change a community, or maybe even change the world. Do you believe it could happen? See, this is not some fairy tale that we're reading. This is a real story that actually happened with real people. So Acts chapter 2, if you have a Bible, turn with me there. You can open up your Bible app on your phone. Or if you don't have either, you can just kind of absorb, listen, tune in. So in Acts chapter 2, last week we talked about the firefall when the Holy Spirit fell down on them. And our, this is really strong, this emphasis, emphasis on the community of faith. Not one person in the dorm room having a Jesus moment, worshiping their face, face off, right? It was together God fell on them as they sought the Lord together. And they camped out for 10 days in the upper room. So in Acts chapter 2, right after the firefall, and then boom, we have Peter, right? Do you remember Peter? By the way, Peter is the dude that did what? He does not have a stellar spiritual resume, this, this dude Pete, right? Like what did he do? Right? He sold Jesus out, right? He's, he, he could have been the guy that kicked down the gate and went in and like knocked people over. I mean, he could have, he could have gone Rambo on the... On the, on the temple guards and rescued Jesus. You know, he could have orchestrated this military operation, this covert night op and somehow rescued Jesus. But like this 14-year-old girl said, hey, don't, aren't you friends with Jesus? And he said, no, heck no, I don't know that dude. He denied him. And yet here's the same dude that denied Jesus. And you should, you should receive great encouragement from this like I do. Because there, there's certain points of all of our journey where we stab Jesus in the back. Let's be honest. Am I the only one? You know, like Judas, you kiss Jesus on the cheek while you stab him in the back. I mean, we all walk in the sandals of Judas. We all walk in the sandals of Peter from time to time. And now Peter stands up and delivers really the first Christian sermon. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. And he goes into this, this is a summary of his um, of his sermon, and I won't, I'm not going to go into the, the actual message, but I, I do want to talk about the opportunity to present truth. See, this was a God-initiated, Spirit-driven moment, and we all have those. This is not just a special Bible moment here that only happened at a certain place at a certain time with special people. Pentecost was, but we all have those God-initiated, Spirit-driven moments in our lives, and Peter sees the opportunity that God had created. So I want you to get the difference here. Like when you want to share your faith with someone, when you want to share truth with someone, how do we do it in a way that's effective? Well, we follow in the footsteps of Peter. We follow in the footsteps of the early church, and we let God initiate, God create the opportunities. 
Have you ever been around someone that tries to force truth, tries to force feed truth on somebody else? You know, you're just hanging out on campus and then homeboy rolls in, stands up on a bucket, and then starts just yelling at folks, right? God sent me here to tell you that you all suck, right? And you're all going to be like kindling for the fires of hell. You see them on campus. They come like every year, right, unfortunately. And that is counterproductive. Would you not agree that's counterproductive? How many of y'all were saved at one of those things where you walk by and you're just bebopping along on your way to class and all of a sudden somebody's like, hey, you suck, man. God hates you. <laughs> I, wa I want to hear more. <laughs> Where do I sign up? Where's the clipboard, man? I want to support your ministry. <laughs> Never happens, right? Girl walks by with like a skirt on. Hey, you know, and he starts calling her names. Hey, I bet you, whatever. And how my, how, she's like, you know what? I'm going to go home and put on a long dress. That, that dude is right. Never happens. As a matter of fact, it's counterproductive because what, what ends up happening is it's pushes people away from faith rather than bringing them closer to the cross, and it reinforces this caricature of Christianity. It's counterproductive to furthering the kingdom of God. But this is not what Peter's doing. This is not something that they created. They didn't get in the upper room and say, you know what, how do we reach Jerusalem? Well, we need to go out on the street and just start preaching to folks. No, God initiated, it was a God-initiated, spirit-driven moment, and Peter sees the opportunity that God had created. Now, I know what some of you are thinking are like, listen, John, when the fire falls, like pieces of fire falling on campus, I will tell them where it comes from. Remember last week, it was heaven fire, not hell fire. I'll tell them it's from God. I'll tell them about Jesus. I'll do what Peter did. But mo more than likely, you're not going to get such an extravagant sign from heaven but here's the deal, is that we all have those God-initiated, spirit-driven moments in our lives where, like Peter, we need to seize the opportunities to share the truth, the opportunity that God created for us to share the truth. So in, in to chapter 2, verse 37, when the people heard this, this sermon by Peter, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So that, when God initiates the, the moment where you share truth, it goes below the surface. All right, so I want you to turn the person beside you, and I want you to tap them like this. See, that's, that's a man-initiated moment. That's all I can do. That's all you can do. We can tap on the outside. Hey, you're a sinner. Hey, you're, you know, you, you need to do better, be better, try harder. You know, you're tapping them like this, pointing at them, right? You need to become more like me so we can hang out. Man, I wish girl, homegirl would get saved so I could ask her out. You know, I was like, you, you, yeah, I'm talking to you. Me? Yes. I mean, everybody always, you know, they, they, they know, they feel, I think a lot of people feel the guilt of their failure. But when it comes to this, when it comes to who's going who's gonna to tap on the inside, who's going to hit the heart, man, only God can do that. It says when Peter was talking, it was a God-initiated, spirit-driven moment, and Peter sees the opportunity to share the truth, right? It's God touching the heart. That's what we're going after, right? It's not me trying to emotionally manipulate you to make some decision so I can get some Avenger notch on my Avenger belt, where I use my Avanja cube, to, so whatever. There is such a thing, and I have used it before. Check this out. It's not emotional manipulation, right? Where, I, you know, where it's all about me moving a crowd, external pressure moving you to the altar, saying, okay, if, if you love your grandma, if you had a puppy when you were a kid, if you're struggling at all, if you need better grades, if you need better self-esteem, right? Come on down. Right now, and now, all of a sudden, everybody's down here, man. And you ask them, you know, it's like a youth camp moment, man. You know, Michael W. Smith blaring on the background, friends are friends forever, and we're sitting on the altar. 
and they're pass, passing the Kleenex around, and all the girls are hugging, and all the dudes are, you know, they're trying to act like they're not crying. And it's all happening right here. And I walk up to one of the teenagers and say, hey, man, why are you here? What's God doing? I don't know, man. I just don't know. Okay, well, I mean, what decision do you want to make? I just, man, you know, I just, I just love God. You know, I'm, my, my, my grandma. I mean, I'm serious. And that is an emotional moment with a imaginary God. It's a man-made moment that's more about the preacher and the worship leader than it is about God and the person. But that's not what Peter's about. This is in the bright open daylight, man. They're out on the streets of Jerusalem. It's in the middle of the day. The sun's shining down. There is no light show. There is no, you know, music playing in the background coaxing you down the aisle. No, it's God doing it. And when God does it, right, it's going to be below the surface. And that's what happens here. And people respond, man. In chapter, 40, uh, chapter 2, verse 41, so they're cut to the heart, right? That's what we're going for. And in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. And how many? What does it say there? What's the number? 3,000 people became Christians. Let me tell you something. Okay, here we are. In the streets of Jerusalem, you got Peter, the dude. This is like a rough cut brother with calluses on his hands. I mean, this is like Corn Fred Country Boy, right? That was a fisherman. You know, he's not this professionally trained orator. He's not this powerful speaker. This dude was catching fish not that long ago, and he's standing on a bucket in a dirt road in Jerusalem, and it's in the middle of the day, and he's saying, hey, Jesus died on the cross for y'all's sins, and you need to get saved. And three, they were cut to the heart because it was a God-initiated moment. And Peter sees the opportunity that God had created in 3,000 people. How do I get saved? Right? They were asking him, hey, brother, how do I get what you have? How do I receive what you're offering? This Jesus, it was God doing it on the inside, man. There was a little soul surgery going on there. And that's what happens when God does the work, when it's spirit-initiated outreach and evangelism. And now, here we are, 2,000 years later, and you have a professionally trained collegiate ministry specialist standing on a stage that's in a million dollar room with a sound system that costs who knows what, with this amazing worship and this amazing set and these amazing lights, and I'm, and I'm, I'm communicating as best as I can, and the altars are empty. And the altars are empty, not just here, but in a lot of places. So what that, what that tells me is this, is I can't do it. We can't do it. You know, we, we don't have the resources. I don't care what we did, man. We don't have, because I can't touch somebody's heart. Only God through the Holy Spirit can reach below the surface and fix what's broken. So that's what we need. We don't need more of stuff that currently isn't working, more of stuff that, in, that just kind of the altars are empty. We need whatever they had 2,000 years ago. Right? This fisherman, this corn-fed country boy that is not an eloquent speaker, he's not entertaining, he's not funny, he's probably a little bit offensive. He's probably got a little bit of Mark Driscoll in him. He's probably, you know, just looking at folks. What are you looking at? You know, he's probably like a rough dude, like he's a rough-cut guy. You know, and then through him, he communicates the gospel as best as he knows how. He hadn't been to seminary, Right? He's not a public speaker. 3,000 people in the middle of the day on a street. That's what I want us to get here is that God did it. God did it. And let me just drive this home for us. So that's great, man. So this rough cut country boy, you know, did his thing 2,000 years ago. And 3,000 people, great, 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 well, yada, yada. What does that mean for me? Here it is. It's where, where in our lives today do we need to join God where he is already working? So here it is. It's not you bringing Christ to the campus. I know it's a shock to some of you, 
Let's bring Christ to the campus, right? And you're standing on the edge of university there. You're looking out across to the campus and saying, I'm about to, I'm about to bring God to this campus. Get ready for it, right? And you, you know, the, you got the, like the music in the background of your head, you know, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. Or maybe it's Eye of the Tiger, or maybe it's a mixture of both. That'd be a pretty, that'd be a, a pretty sick mix. But here's the deal. God is already there. I'm going to bring Christ to my fraternity. I'm going to bring Christ to my sorority. I'm going to bring Christ to the football team. I'm going to bring Christ, and I'm going to shine the light. This little light of mine, I'm going to illuminate. I'm going to light it up. Here's the deal. God's already there. He's already at Texas Tech. He's already at LCU. He's already at South Plains. He's already in your apartment. He's already at your dorm. He's already in the fraternity. He's already in the sorority. Our job is not to bring him. Our job is to join him where he's already working. So there are people all around you that are spiritually open to the truth. And it will become a God-initiated, spirit-driven conversation rather than some awkward conversation with a stranger. So uh, how about that Super Bowl? You know, you're waiting on the bus to come on campus or whatever, and you're waiting on the uh, little walkie sign at the crosswalk, which by the way, you need to wait, go to the crosswalk students. You guys are kamikazes, man. You can, <laughs> I'm driving across campus, it's like a video game. <laughs> man, I'm, I'm just feeling so stressed out because I'm about to take somebody out, man. But you're sitting there and you're waiting for the little, um, little walk sign. So uh, how about those Seahawks, man? Love, Rus love Russell Wilson, solid dude. Yeah, but what about Jesus? So, you know, these awkward conversations that we have with strangers, and it's a man-initiated, it's a human-driven thing that really becomes counterproductive to the gospel because it reinforces a preconceived notion in the mind of a non-believer about what Christians are and maybe who God is. So here's the question for you, is who in your life do you need to start seizing the opportunities that God is creating to have those truth conversations, those gospel conversations? Not with everybody. This is a small group of people. This is not gimmicky. This is not emotional manipulation. This is you opening your eyes, me opening my eyes, and seeing the people that God has placed around us, and he's drawing, up, he's drawing them to himself. And here's the cool part of God's plan. He wants to use us as an important part, as a critical part, as a necessary part of his plan to reach the person that he's placed in your path. That's crazy, isn't it? Why would God use me? I'm a spiritual scrub, man. There's other more qualified people. But listen, he hasn't put that person in my path. They're not on my radar. They're in your path. And you have a place of influence in their life that I will never have. You know, I'm just going to bring in the pro. John, what's your number, man? As soon as that conversation is about to happen, I'm going to text you up, and you're going to, like, parachute in, right? I'm just like, like the Avenger dude that just kind of pops out of nowhere. It's like a superhero. Where, where, where'd he go? That dude's sneaky. It's you. The people around your life that God has placed in your path, and it's beginning to pray for them. You're beginning to intentionally invest in that relationship for the purpose of gospel influence. This is not gimmicky or manipulation. This is God at work, and we get to join God where he's already working. So who came to mind? Right? Don't shout out their name because they might be sitting beside you. This dude needs some Jesus. Matter of fact, I'm glad he's here. I'm glad he's listening to you right now. Uh, who came to mind when I said, okay, who has God placed in your path that he hasn't placed in my path? They're in your fraternity. They're in your sorority. They're on your intramural team. They're your coworker, right? You're slinging burritos somewhere. Oh, you're, wet, you're busting tables somewhere, and they're there with you. Open your eyes. See who God has placed around you. And then seize the opportunity that God creates as you have those gospel conversations. Not the awkward ones with strangers, 
but the effective ones that further the kingdom. So what did this group of new believers do, right? Let's move on here quickly. So after Peter, boom, they explode out of the upper room. This is firefall to wildfire, okay? How did it become wildfire, right? Because they have the firefall, which is an amazing thing. It's a God-initiated moment, the spirit-driven moment. They bust out of the upper room onto the street. Peter stands up and he seizes the opportunity that God creates and 3,000 people. But here, it's still a local movement. This is a local thing. I mean, this is, this is way far from a global movement. So how did this local movement that was, they, had, they have yet to pass the city limits of Jerusalem. And yet, 2,000 years later, here we are in West Texas, and we are a byproduct of what I'm reading in Acts chapter 2. Man, how did it cross an ocean? How did it reach tribes in Africa? How is it translated into thousands of dialects globally? And yet it started in this upper room in this podunk global dot on the map. So that's the question here is how did it spread? Because we need to really answer this question and hone in because how did it go from local to global? That's going to answer the question of how we take it from here to out there. If it's not external, it's got to be God-driven, spirit-initiated. So what did they do? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves, say devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, say together, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what did they do that took them from a little local Bible study to a global spiritual movement? This is what they did right here. It's a great summary of how they took these 3,000 new converts and invested and mobilized them to jump the city limits and become a global movement. This is from firefall to wildfire. The first thing is they devoted themselves. And this is where, this is why some of you came tonight, just to hear this part right now, is they devoted themselves. This was not a superficial connection. This was much more than a casual commitment. So let me ask you, have you come to a place where you have devoted yourself to God. Not just, you know what, I'm free on Thursday. If there's nothing better to do, I guess I'll go. <laughs> or if, if my friend goes, I'll go. Or if she goes, I'll go. It, it's, it's more than that. It's more than just, you know, I'll, I'll make every Sunday, every now and then. Have you come to a place personally where you've devoted yourself and it was not just a one-time commitment? The way it's written here in, in the language of, of the New Testament, it it's ongoing. One translation said they, continual, they continued steadfastly. They continually devoted themselves. So it's not a one-time commitment. Man, I devoted myself to Jesus at vacation Bible school when I was eight months old. Like, whoa, that's awesome. So your first word was Jesus? That's pretty amazing. No, I mean, I devoted myself at youth camp when I was in sixth grade, and I devoted, and that's great, that's awesome, I'm glad you made that commitment, but it's more than a one-time commitment. You don't get your Jesus card that you hang on the wall or you put in your wallet. This is an ongoing, continual action of devotion. So it's a daily decision to be devoted to God. Did, did you wake up this morning and say, I'm going to do my best to live for God? Remember last week, you can catch the podcast if, if you want to go back. I'm not going to reteach last week's lesson. But it was a daily sacrifice of ourselves upon the altar of our hearts. I mean, the fire falls and it consumes the sacrifice. Who was the sacrifice? It was us, right? We are the temple. We are the priest. And we bring the sacrifice to the altar daily. 
It's not a one and done deal. So devotion is a big deal. If you're not devoted, then you're not going to buy in. If you're not committed, then you're not going to be a part of what God's doing. I mean, the beautiful part is God used these self-absorbed original followers. And they're pretty broken, right? They're pretty self-absorbed. Jesus, when you conquer the world, give me a city. Or matter, give me a country. I want to name a town after me. And I might even throw a bone to my friends and name some towns after them. They were, they were like self-absorbed, these disciples were. Peter, the rest of them, I mean, they were all. And yet God used these self-absorbed original followers to change the world. So if you're in a point right now and you're like, I'm not devoted, man. You're right. I suck as a Christian, man. I mean, I'm, you know, that's, that's okay. You're in the right place. But you need to come to a point where you devote yourself to what matters most. Are you devoted academically? Let's be honest, man. Okay, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying we're more devoted academically to a temporary class than we are sometimes to eternal things. Are you more upset about flunking a test than you are, that, that, than you are about the fact that you haven't cracked open your Bible in six months? Oh, yeah, whatever. I mean, if you have a what if, what if, dude, if you have a what if, dude, attitude about spiritual things and eternal things, then I have to question the level of your devotion because a devotion translates into obedience. And that's what these original followers had. And that was the first thing. They devoted themselves. It was continual action. They persevered, a daily decision to be devoted. And what were they first devoted to? This is interesting here, and this is probably the biggest part of, the, of this book, really. It's the story of a faith community. Yeah, you have some amazing individual expressions, but they are products of a faith community. So you need to make a commitment to a Christian community, to a church. They were together. You need to get this here because God used them. God used them. Fellowship is essential to our growth in godliness. Fellowship is essential. They committed themselves to the fellowship, and it was an essential part of their growth in godliness. Fellowship is not an optional accessory to Christianity. Christian community has a cumulative effect on our faith. It deepens us. But when you separate yourself, when you isolate yourself, you struggle to be devoted. I do. My devotion really becomes questionable when I'm not committed to Christian community. You ever noticed that before? Man, I don't need church. Uh, I don't need you Christians. That's a, man, that's a big red flag, huge red flag, all right? So you're going to go toe-to-toe with Satan, and you're going to just whip him every day because you're better. You're better than the Bible people. You're better than everybody else. We need community. It is essential, not an optional accessory to Christianity. It's an essential part of our growth in godliness. See, the early church, they shared meals together. There's something spiritual, uh, spiritual. There's something spiritual. <laughs> There's something special <laughs> about sharing a meal together. Would you agree with that? That's why I like to buy meals for students, to be honest with you. And some of you are like, light bulb. John likes to buy meals for students. I'm a student, right? That's why I encourage uh, our, our leadership, our, our interns, to, to buy coffee or buy meals for, for students because it says they broke bread together with glad and sincere hearts. When you're sharing a meal with someone, that's why I encourage you to get together with a Christian sister or a Christian brother, right, and to fellowship, right? And a lot of the times that happens over food. They broke bread every day and, you know, they did the Lord's Supper, but they also shared meals together. And that's when, you get, that's when it feels like home, right? That's when it feels like family, when you're sitting around a table and you are just chomping down on some fried chicken or whatever, right? And you're just, I mean, you're slinging barbecue sauce. And it's awesome when I'm with the dudes, that is. I mean, you're just eating with your hands. It's primal. It's... it's but it's, it's, a, it's a part of fellowship. They broke bread together. I encourage you to have meals scheduled with other believers. 
Right, this sounds weird, but I'm telling you, it's, it, it's true. When you're just standing there, so, bro, how's your life, how's your spiritual life? You know, and it's like crickets chirping in the background. Good, I guess. You? Oh, man, I'm good. Sweet. <laughs> you know, uh, all right, fellowship, accomplice, check the box. No, but when you're sitting at Freebirds, you know, or you're sitting somewhere like at Saison's, uh, you're sitting at this place or at a, at a table at the, at the sub, you know, and all of a sudden when you're, you know, eating, it breaks down some barriers and somehow it's easier to talk. Preferably when you're not chewing. <laughs> but they shared meals together. They prayed together. They studied the word together. They praised God together. So what's the key word here? What's the key word? Together. Let's say it together. together. That's the key word, and you can't miss this. I'm telling you, some of you guys are these religious lone rangers, and you're getting your butt kicked by the enemy on a regular basis. And you think more of the same is going to solve the problem. I'm just going to distance myself further from worship and from praising God and from small groups and Bible study and fellowship and eating food with Christians. <laughs> Listen, you're getting defeated. I mean, Satan is opening up a six pack of butt whoop on you. <laughs> he is cracking open a can of butt whoop on you weekly. And more of the same is not going to solve the problem. Come into community. It's what he's saying. It's not, this is it's an essential part. How do we develop more of a hunger for the things of God? Because other people are helping to create that hunger. God ultimately is the source of that through the Spirit, but yet there's other people that have a direct impact on my relationship with God. You ever, when Paul said this, Paul said, you, to the Filipinos, no, it was the Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippines. When, when Paul said to the Philippians, now every time somebody says, open your Bibles to Philippians, you're going to think, Filipinos. Hmm. And you're going to smile to yourself. A little private joke that we have now. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, you make my joy complete. Oh, isn't that interesting? Other people had a direct impact on Paul's spiritual life. Other people, other Christians in the church had a direct impact on his level of joy. And the same is true for you. The same is true for me. People can lift us up and people can tear us down. You need to put your life in a place that's going to build you up spiritually and make you stronger spiritually, help you win a few more battles so the key word is together. We have community groups here, and I'm going to invite you to sign up. If you're not a part of a community group, they meet different nights of the week. We have some rock-solid community group leaders. They're students just like you. They're walking the same hallways, man. They're studying for the same test. They're stressed out about the same things. And here they are living for God on the front lines. So we have some community group leaders that, that stand ready um, to walk with you. And so when we dismiss, we have a sign-up table in the back. Some of our, one of our interns or some of our leaders will be back there to sign you up. Take that step, man. Drop the pride. Stop going solo and being defeated on a regular basis. Go sign up for a community group, right? We, there's a variety of groups that meet different nights, different places, different times. We have life groups that meet Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. We have a worship service at 930. I mean, some of you guys are plugged into other churches, and I would encourage you with this. Whatever church you're connected to, you take the next step and go to the next level, and you get connected to a small group. You don't show up in a big sanctuary and hide in the crowd. You get connected to a gospel community at Redeemer. You get connected to whatever eLife has. They have small groups for you guys. You go, and you take the initiative, and you take the next step. And if you're a part of First Baptist, I'm challenging you and asking you. We have paved the road for you to experience community. And if you're, not, if you're not taking advantage of it, that's not on me. Okay. You take the initiative because you know you need it. I know I need it. 
So God added to their number. That's the, that's the end of the story here, at least for, this, for tonight. God did it. They did their part. See, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread and to fellowship and to prayer. So they did their part. They lived this devoted life. And all of a sudden, God grew the group. God spread the gospel through them when they were devoted. They did their part and God did his part. God added to their number, it says here. It's written in the passive voice. That means God did the work. It wasn't their effective outreach programs or evangelism training. All right, that's what we need, okay? That's what we need. We need more training. Listen, students, let's be honest, okay? We are the most trained group of Christians in the history of Christianity. We are the most educated Christians in the history of the church. You have more literature and resources available to you today than the previous 2,000 years combined. But we need more of it, right? Because that's the answer is more education. If somebody would just write a new book, you know, that's what I need, man. I'm just waiting on that magic podcast to, to like ignite my spiritual life. Man, if Chandler would just write another, he is writing another book on marriage, right? Maybe that's going to be the one. And you're just camped out at the parking lot of the Lifeway, just the bookstore, just waiting, <laughs> waiting. And that's not it. If we are devoted, right, uh, Richard Foster has a quote, and he says, the, what the world, what the church needs today is not more talented Christians. We have more talented people now than ever before. Not more gifted people, not more educated people. What we need in the church, according to Foster, is deeper followers of Christ. People of substance, and that comes from a lifestyle of devotion, we need devoted followers, people that are bought in. It's not this, uh, whatever, dude, attitude. It's I'm pushing it all across the table, man, as best as I know how, and I'm all in with what matters most in life. Devotion. That's what they had that led to their growth, and that's what we need. God did the work. God grew the church. It wasn't the church using gimmicks to get people to attend. Next week, I'm going to give away an iWatch. Are those out yet? You might have, no, they're not out yet. Okay. Next week, I'm going to give away a MacBook, right? Invite your friends. That's a, that is a man-made evangel moment, right? That is not a God-initiated, spirit-driven thing. So we have 2,000, next week we're going to give away a cruise to the Bahamas, man. Invite your fraternity brothers, fraternity sisters. We're giving away a round trip weekend to Las Vegas. Right? That, that's not what I'm talking about. It's not gimmicks. It wasn't them coming up with new methods or techniques. It was God doing it through their devotion, their devoted living. There's no shortcuts. I know some of y'all want a shortcut, right? Man, I don't want to be devoted. <laughs> you know? Come on, brother. You know, I'm busy, man. You know, it's 21st century. I got places to go, people to see, things to do. I mean, they didn't have that back then. So surely God understands there's got to be a shortcut now for me. And there's not. There is no substitute for personal devotion. You need to write that down right here in the little freebie page. The one you doodle on in church. There is no substitute for personal devotion. So if you, if you have these amazing ministry leaders, you have a stage full of incredibly gifted people, you have a church that believes in university ministry that is dumping a, a, you know, a truckload of resources into you and to reaching your campus and your generation, that is not going to do it. There's no substitute for you because God has placed people on your radar that he hasn't placed on my radar. I'm the creepy old guy on campus. Somebody dialed 911, man. You got a creeper on campus. Hey, I'm a university pastor, I promise. You know, I'm not one of those guys that drives the van with no windows. The wife beater and the mustache. That's not me, okay? I'm not that dude. I can't be in your dorm room, okay? That would be illegal. <laughs> Definitely creepy. Welcome been waiting for you. <laughs> I'm not going to roll up into the sub with my Greek scrolls. Not going to happen. 
And even if I did, it'd be counterproductive, right? It, it wouldn't connect with people because you are there and God has placed you there and you need to be devoted so you can be a person of gospel influence in your little piece of the planet. That's the way it's going to work. And if you partner that, now this is where it becomes combustible, man. If you partner that devotion in the room out here with the church and ministries and churches in this town that believe in you and that invest in you and that will fan the flame so the firefall becomes a wildfire, that's a combustible combination right there. Boom. That's when the firefall becomes a wildfire. When you get a group of devoted people and we're, and we're in the same place. So God did it, and he'll do it again. They were faithful. They were continually devoting themselves. They were continually encouraging each other. And it says here that there was a sense of awe. Now, I find that to be a very intriguing adjective. There was a sense of awe over what God was doing and who God is and what he was doing in my life, what he is doing in my life, and through my life, and around my life, all is an overwhelming feeling of reverence and admiration, amazement, wonder. So as Johnny and the band comes back up, that's how I'm going to wrap it up and drive it home. Is man, when's the last time you were amazed at the goodness of God? When was the last time you were in awe when you stood in the presence of the one true creator of all things, the God that created all there ever was and all there ever will be, and somehow he knows who you are. He knows every head, hair on your head, and he loves you anyway. The God that sent his only begotten son to be tortured and murdered so that I might have a relationship with him. When's the last time? You were in awe of the gospel. Maybe that's the first step. To recapture that amazement of God's grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And saved a wretch like me. Some of us are bored. Holy things have become way too common. Sacred things have become ordinary things in your life. And so you throw your Bible on your dorm bunk. You throw your Bible and just throw it around. Because you have a bunch of them, right? Worship's not a big deal because, man, if you don't go here, there's, uh, there's 10 other places in town. You can go to worship tomorrow night or next week. Or I mean, if you don't go anywhere, you can just kind of download a podcast or get on YouTube and watch Francis Chan. No big deal, right? These holy things that have become common, and they lost their significance. So we're not in awe anymore. We're bored with sacred things and holy things. We're bored with God. So there was, a, there was a sense of awe that came over the early church, and it was a corporate communal amazement. It's like everybody looking at Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls. It's like everybody looking at something that is breathtaking. It's like everybody looking together at the same thing, and we are amazed, and our source of amazement is the same. We come from different places and different zip codes. We have different struggles and different regrets. We have different dreams and different futures, but we are amazed by the same thing. And that is the Son of God, the God-man bleeding on the tree. Should take our breath away. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for nights like this. We can pull away from the craziness for just a few moments and get our hearts right. So I pray all that's been said tonight, everything that's been laid on the table, I pray, God, your spirit would sort through it. And what's been of me will quickly disappear and be forgotten. But what's been presented that's of you will linger long after we leave this, this room. In these next few minutes, what I pray would be significant that we take that next step towards you, that we'd be able to recapture some of that amazement or maybe be amazed at the first, for the first time at the foot of the cross. Open our eyes, let us see, in Jesus' name. There's some people in the back if you want to pray. That's our prayer team. That were, they've been, they prayed the first part of our service. They'll be in the back to pray with you. If you need somebody just to pray with, they're ready to receive you back there.
See you. 